Betty graduated from medical school and was planning to enter a residency program. However, unexpectedly, her father passed away. Her father was covering her education expenses, and the problem now was that they didn't live together. Betty's parents had divorced when she was still in school, but her father had always dreamed of her becoming a doctor. Despite leaving the family, he kept his promise and continued to fund Betty's education. Now that he was gone, Betty's stepmother had no intention of spending money on her. Not only did she not like Betty, but she couldn't stand her. In her father's second marriage, there were no children, and he provided for his two daughters from his second wife. However, he didn't forget about his own daughter, unlike many others in similar situations. Many of Betty's classmates had divorced parents, and it was rare for a father to come on Sundays, take them for a walk in the park, or treat them to ice cream in a cafe in winter. And even then, not every Sunday. More often than not, after leaving the family, fathers completely forgot about the existence of their children, and alimony payments were irregular. Some just sent gifts once a year on their birthdays. Yet, Betty's father continued to play a role not only in her destiny, but also in her life. He visited, took her to his new family, and was genuinely upset when his new wife's children spoke ill of Betty. As Betty grew older, she asked her father to meet somewhere other than at his home. Now they often walked along the waterfront, sat in the park, or had lunch at a restaurant. Her father frequently invited her to restaurants, teaching her good manners, appreciation of good food, etiquette, and proper behavior. It was in a restaurant that he announced he would cover her education after school. It was in a small but very glamorous establishment. All tables were adorned with clean, starched, snow-white tablecloths. The tableware was already set for two or more people, with cozy antique-style table lamps, well-cared-for home flowers scattered everywhere. The restaurant was located on an old steamboat, transformed into a modern motor vessel, drifting from pier to pier. It had a very cozy and romantic atmosphere. Betty then thought it would be nice if someone proposed to her in a similar place. At that time, no one was on the horizon except for John from the parallel class. But a husband from John would definitely be no good, thought Betty. Although, truth be told, at 16, Betty already understood that her father was simply wonderful as a dad, but definitely not as a husband. He left one family, created another, and now secretly met with his daughter from the first marriage and the first wife. Once, Betty caught her parents at home, returning earlier from a hiking trip by two whole days. Two girls had a real fight over a boy, not just a quarrel. They had to cancel everything and return the students home in groups to separate the rivals and their sympathizers and the support group. Betty wasn't on anyone's side. She just answered the geography teacher when he asked, who else wants to go home? And Betty agreed. When she entered her home, her mom for some reason rushed out of the room, zipping her robe on the go, and her dad, red as a tomato, sat on the couch. He immediately darted out of the apartment. There are no ex-wives, mom dryly said and started preparing dinner. Betty and her mom didn't revisit this topic, but since then, Betty began to excuse herself more often to a friend's place on weekends and the like. Right after the incident, she feared most that her dad would stop seeing her. But when he called to arrange a new meeting, it was as if a weight had been lifted from her shoulders. You know, Dad, we're adults. Let's just not discuss it, Betty blurted out at the meeting. Although, in reality, she had been preparing a speech for a long time about how happy she was for her mom and dad. Maybe there was a chance that her parents would be together again, and her dad would come home from that wicked Jessica and her detestable offspring. I knew you would understand, Dad said with relief. And Betty saw how a burden seemed to be lifted from his shoulders. They never returned to that conversation. Betty no longer saw her dad at home, 
and she didn't know if her mom and dad took advantage of the freedom she granted them or if it was their only meeting. Soon, Betty learned that her mom had indeed taken advantage. She got married, but not to her dad. Betty was just finishing school. So, most likely, John was definitely not suitable for the role of a future husband. He was just good at kissing. Betty didn't know when or how she would meet her love. She didn't even imagine what kind of person he would be. But she knew in exquisite detail what kind of marriage proposal she would like to receive. And most importantly, where. Betty's relationship with her stepmother's husband didn't develop smoothly, just like with her father's second wife. She simply didn't like him. She disliked the way he looked at her, didn't appreciate how he entered her room without knocking. And when she received her diploma, a surprise awaited her at home. Her stepfather simply kicked Betty out of her own home. He said that school was over, and it meant the beginning of independent adult life. After all, the graduation certificate is aptly named a maturity certificate. That's it, you've matured. Take your bags and roll out, her stepfather said. Her mom quietly cried on the couch, wiping away tears and staying silent. What struck Betty was not only that her stepfather kicked her out without any means of support, but also her mother's modest silence. After all, it was her apartment. Hers and Betty's. Who was this audacious person who thought he had the right to dispose of Betty's property and fate? That property being the apartment that, by the way, her mom and Betty's dad left them. Betty grabbed her bag threw in the things she saw, slammed the door loudly, and went to her friend's place. She spent two days there at her friend's summer cottage, then another two days at home. But then, judging by her friend's mother's look, Betty understood that she couldn't live there for the rest of her life. She called her dad and suggested meeting in their favorite place, that same restaurant. Have you thought about where to apply? Her father asked. Well, I haven't really thought about it yet, honestly. With my exam scores, probably nowhere, Betty replied. Her father had been quite prosperous even before Betty was born, but after the divorce, especially after the second marriage, his fortune skyrocketed. I'll buy you an apartment and cover your education, but I have one condition, her father said and didn't finish, as Betty threw herself at him. Daddy, you're the best in the world. Thank you. You're the only one who loves me. Betty babbled. Yeah, hold on, don't rejoice yet. You don't even know the condition, her father said. What is it? Betty smiled cheerfully. I want you to go into medicine. Not just medicine, but cardiology, her father said. I know it involves working with the heart, surgeries, and you practically can't stand the sight of blood. But that's my condition. Daddy, for you, I'm ready to become an astronaut. Anything you want. Remember, a couple of times I fainted at the sight of a scratch. That was an early childhood. Believe me, as a girl, I'm well acquainted with the red liquid. Betty twisted her lips in a disgusted smile. Well, that settles it, her father said. But just so you know, I don't want you to just bring me medical diplomas. I want you to become a real, qualified, practicing cardiologist. And that's not just five years of study, it's another two years of residency. So, I have to study for seven years to become a doctor? Betty's eyes almost popped out at how she rounded them. Well, some study for eight if they go for internships after college, and then another two years of residency. But that's for those who have little money. It's a path for the poor. There's a shorter path, directly into the residency after college. It's also paid, but I'll take care of the financial side of things, her father said and noticeably paled. He closed his eyes for a second and winced. When he looked at Betty again, 
He was cheerful and lively, his eyes sparkled mischievously as always, and the blush returned to his face. Dad, are you okay? Betty asked with concern. Yes, everything's fine. Just a little pain in the temple, but it's already gone, he said. Maybe you should see a doctor? Betty asked worriedly. Yes, I told you, everything's fine. Ice cream, anyone, he asked. Her father booked a hotel room for Betty, and a week later, she moved into her own apartment. It was a one-room apartment, but in the city center and very close to the college, as she later found out. Somewhere deep down, Betty hoped that now her dad would definitely leave Jessica and move in with her. But no, every time after he visited her, he said it was time to go home. Well, maybe just spend a night at my place for once. Betty pleaded. No, I'll go. Jessica will worry, her father replied. May Jessica burn in hell. Betty muttered half under her breath when she closed the door behind her father. Studying went well, and Betty really enjoyed it. She couldn't imagine she would come to love medicine. At first, she thought, well, for the sake of the apartment, I'll just fulfill Dad's wishes. And when all of this is over, I'll just tell him I can't, it's not working out. He's my dad, he'll understand, thought Betty. But in the process of learning, she got involved, started attending lectures and practicals with pleasure. By the fifth year, she couldn't see herself anywhere else but in medicine. And how did her dad guess that it suits her? Betty lived and enjoyed life. The fifth year was coming to an end, and it was time to start thinking about applying for residency. Dad, I need to make the payment, at least half of it, Betty mentioned during one of their meetings. I remember, her father said, and I won't back down from my commitments. I'll transfer it. Betty couldn't have imagined that it was the last time she saw her father. I've overstayed my welcome, he said, starting to leave. Yeah, stay a bit longer. You just arrived, Betty said ironically. Rushing home again, are you? Is Jessica going to worry? It's not about that. I've been very tired lately, constantly feeling sleepy. My hand hurts, and for some reason, the left one. I'm right-handed and don't use this hand for anything, her father suddenly complained. You should see a doctor. Want me to recommend a good one and even arrange an appointment? Betty suggested. No, no need. Just focus on your studies, her father said. He hugged her at the door in a strange and peculiar way, kissing her on the forehead. It was something he had never done before, a gesture Betty only realized later, after everything happened. At that moment, she didn't pay much attention to her father's sudden impulse. The next morning, Betty was awakened by the ringing of the phone. It was a day off, and she had planned to catch up on sleep. The dream was so good. Have you ever noticed that if you're having a good dream, you can never see its ending? Someone will inevitably come, call, knock, crash, fall from the sky, or something else. And you wake up with a feeling of incredible bliss, which is instantly replaced by a sense of great regret and disappointment. Why now? Why did you all suddenly feel the need to call? Betty thought. Hello? Betty answered the phone without even looking at the caller ID, who's disturbing the peace. Probably your father, a stepmother's voice came through the receiver. He's dead, if you're interested. Betty's dream didn't just end. She thought she had woken up in another reality. Who died? Dad? Her dad? Yes, she saw him yesterday. As a future cardiologist, Betty understood that death is such a thing. You can sit and make plans for a vacation six months from now, and in 30 seconds, you're just not there anymore. And all night and even the evening before, anything could happen, develop, and progress. 
The farewell is tomorrow at the morgue, the stepmother said. Can you hear me? Well, judging by how you're snoring, you can. Betty couldn't say a word. Some kind of stupor had taken over her. She didn't know how to react in such situations. Why are you silent? Do you think I have time for your whims now? The stepmother persisted. How did it happen? An accident? Betty asked. Betty, you're our accident, understand. You didn't know that your father had a heart condition, the stepmother erupted. Who has a heart condition? Betty asked again. Oh God, you're so stupid, and you're studying to be a doctor, the stepmother snapped. And she hung up. Betty couldn't come to her senses for a long time. She wanted to call her mother, but then she thought, why bother? Since the day her stepfather kicked her out, they had only seen each other a couple of times. Her mom refused even to step into the apartment her father bought. Betty couldn't bring herself to enter the house where she was born and raised. It seemed like her mother wanted to have a child with her second husband, but something went wrong and she had a miscarriage, and then another one. Betty didn't delve into it. It was not only uninteresting, but also unpleasant to think about. At Betty's funeral, she learned a lot of new things about her father. It turns out he had long had a heart condition, and that was precisely why he had dreamed of his daughter becoming a cardiologist. Since childhood, he either had a heart defect, or doctors had found some noises. Betty also discovered that she had two sisters, the daughters of Jessica. They were older than Betty, one by a whole eight years, and the other by two years. It happened that Jessica's father had known Betty's father for a long time. It wasn't Jessica who crossed Betty's mother's path, it was the other way around. When the eldest daughter was born, they and Jessica were young. They thought they were free from prejudices, and passport stamps weren't necessary for them. When the second girl was born, Jessica's father himself started talking about marriage. However, they needed to gather the children for school and daycare, feed and take care of them, so instead of a wedding, the father invested all the funds in business. Jessica didn't want just a civil marriage. She dreamed of seeing herself in a white dress and the girls in little angel costumes holding her veil. In the end, the father left. Not for work, apparently, but to expand the business or something else. During his trip, he met Betty's mother. They had a one-time affair, and the father regretted it the next morning. A month later, he found out that the woman would soon become a mother for the third time. Moreover, she insisted on marriage, threatening to tell everyone about what he had done and inform his business partners. Many deals and contracts would have gone down the drain foreign partners don't like such precedents. They can't trust people who can't sort out their own lives. They prefer stability. Then she even threatened not just to get rid of the child, but herself as well. The father had no choice but to marry Betty's mother since he wasn't officially married to Jessica. He apologized to her. Some even said he knelt down, begged Jessica to let him see the children. He promised that when the child was born, he would get a divorce. But Betty's mother found new ways to keep Betty's father. Finally, she agreed to give him freedom. What she demanded from him for the divorce is known only to them. The father brought Jessica with the daughters because he had settled in a new city and could finally marry his beloved woman. Jessica forgave him, but he became attached to Betty. He understood that the girl was not to blame. She grew up in an atmosphere of love and happiness, and with the divorce of her parents, Betty's world was already turned upside down. Revealing to a 10-year-old girl the information that her father never loved her mother and that she had two sisters would be blasphemous. They agreed not to tell Betty anything. Jessica also understood that the child was not to blame, but she didn't want to accept her. Needless to say, the girls couldn't feel great love for their younger sister. What a twist! 
Betty thought. As an adult with a higher education, she struggled to digest what she had learned. What would have happened to her when she was ten, she couldn't even imagine. The incident with her mother and father when she first returned from a hike came to mind. What was that? If he loved Jessica, what was he doing with her mother in bed for years after the divorce? Not everything was so straightforward with her parents, Betty thought. Otherwise, she wouldn't exist. What kept them together for ten years? Unfortunately, now she couldn't ask her mother, with whom she had strained relations, or her father, whom she buried. By the beginning of the school year, Betty managed to pull herself together somewhat. She was in a disheveled state, but decided to fulfill her father's dream and become a practicing cardiologist. She went to the dean's office to determine where and how her residency would take place. You're not on the lists, the girl at the dean's office said. How come? This must be some mistake, Betty exclaimed. Well, maybe it's a mistake, I don't know. Here's the list, and you're not on it. Did you change your last name? The girl asked. No, I didn't. But my father was supposed to pay at least half. By the time I complete a year, I'll save up for the second half, Betty explained. Then go to the accounting office, sort it out there. Maybe you weren't included in the list due to incomplete payment. I don't know, the girl said. But the same story unfolded in the accounting office. No payment, no records. Nothing. And then it dawned on Betty. The conversation about payment with her father was in the evening, and by the morning, he was gone. Of course, he hadn't paid anything. She had to go to Jessica. She must be aware of everything. What money? Jessica asked, looking at Betty like a snake at a rabbit. But Dad promised to pay for my education, Betty stammered, though initially, she knew she would come and demand what was rightfully hers. In the end, she was his daughter. And even more official than those two. She had a right to a share of her father's estate. You've already messed with my nerves and my daughters for ten years. You took their father away. And now you want to become a resident at our expense? Wouldn't it be better for you to? Jessica said. But I'm also his daughter. I also have a right. Betty started to mutter timidly. No, you don't. No one does except me. Here's the will. Recognize your father's signature? Jessica thrust some paper in front of Betty. It's a copy, of course. The original is kept with the notary. You can go to him and double check. Betty didn't go anywhere, of course. She didn't care anymore. She only understood that her world wasn't just changing before her eyes. It was crumbling like an old building where bricks crack, crumble, and fall here and there. Just a bit more, and it would collapse like a house of cards. Everything around Betty was falling apart, absolutely everything she touched or approached. Everything without her father's involvement turned into sand, dust, slipping through her fingers. It seemed she was like a fish thrown onto the ice, cold, lonely, and lacking air. Suddenly the money ran out, debts for the apartment started to grow, and Betty realized she had to find a job. She had to pull herself up by the collar, just like the famous baron with a German last name did in the fairy tale her father used to read to her in childhood. Thankfully, she didn't have a horse like that baron, otherwise, Betty wouldn't have coped. But she only had herself. She had a diploma from medical school and nothing else. To be or not to be? Betty decided. Maybe someone will hire me somewhere. Unfortunately, Everywhere they needed experienced doctors, not just someone with a diploma. Yes, you should have finished the nursing school. You would have been working for three years already, gaining experience. Why did you go to college right away? You could have obtained higher education while working, they told her. 
but that's what my dad wanted, Betty mumbled. Well, go for an internship or residency. No one will take you without it, they told her. Well, maybe as a nurse, they added. But I have no money. I'm starving. Betty said. Well, you have to do something. What about your dad? They asked. But my dad died, Betty said, tears welling up in her eyes. But the most frustrating part was not this. What was frustrating was that nursing positions were filled everywhere. There was no demand for them. Well, we have a vacancy for a cleaner in the hospice, they said. I agree, Betty said. A cleaner with a college degree, they chuckled in the health department and gave her the coordinates. So, Betty became probably the only janitor in the entire city with a college degree. Her salary barely covered the utility bills, and there was hardly anything left for food. Debts were being paid off, but Betty couldn't keep up with current payments, and debts were piling up again. At some point, she decided to sell the apartment, move into a room in a communal flat or a dormitory, depending on her luck. At least there would be lower communal expenses, no more debts, and some money left for food. One day... A dying old man with the final stage of cancer was brought to the hospice. Betty was cleaning his room when his son came to visit. The son sat beside his father, holding his hand for a long time, a touching scene. Betty regretted not being by her father's side when he had a heart attack. She would have given a lot to hold his hand like that. The son silently held his father's hand, tears dropping from his closed eyes. Suddenly, the old man opened his eyes as if waking up. He saw his son and reached for his hand. The man startled. Dad, Dad, are you feeling better? How do you feel, he fretted. I feel excellent. I saw your mother. She called me to her, but she regretted that I was leaving you alone. Son, promise me you'll get married. Just swear it, and that's it. Find yourself a good girl, the father insisted with a creaky voice. And the son gave a promise, practically on his father's deathbed, that he would marry. Later, Betty finished her work, and three days later, she learned that the old man had passed away. She felt a mixture of sadness and curiosity. Did the son manage to get married in three days? And why hadn't he been married until now? Girl, someone shouted in the corridor, and Betty turned around. Yes, I'm calling you, the girl with the bucket, a man yelled from the other end of the corridor. I'm listening, replied Betty when he approached. It was the son of the dying old man. Betty, is it you? I didn't even recognize you, said the man. John? Oh, my God. You've changed, too. Grown up, I see, Betty exclaimed. Well, I, of course. Probably didn't expect your high school crush to be a janitor. I graduated from medical school. Oh, yes, my condolences, but I thought your father was younger. He is younger, it's just that the illness changed and defeated him. Cancer, you know, said John. I came to you precisely for this matter. Fate, probably, that we went to the same school. But how did I not recognize you when I was talking to my father? Yeah, just tell me, what's the matter? Betty interrupted him. I know you won't refuse, John hesitated and blushed. I saw you overheard our conversation with my father, so I wanted to invite you. I didn't even know it was you. Believe me. In short, be my bride. What? A nervous laugh burst from Betty. She covered her mouth with her hand, changed her expression, and apologized. No, you didn't understand. John continued to stutter out of excitement. I didn't mean it that way. Well, you heard what I promised my father. I want you to be my bride at his funeral. Let, at least in this way, 
his dream will come true, me getting married. You can't imagine how he urged me to get married from school, although he never married himself after my mother's death. Well, yes, I remember. Your mother died early, just after school, said Betty. But would it be fair? Yes, of course, it's fair, Betty. He's good himself. Do you know how many mistresses he had? I will come to the funeral with a bride, so everyone sees, and then the grass can stop growing. No, I can, of course, if something. And John made a strange smirk. Can what? Betty didn't understand. Well, I mean, I can actually get married for real, mumbled John. And tell me, why haven't you been married until now? Our classmates and everyone in your class got married, I heard. Betty asked for some reason, though it seemed she already knew the answer to that question. Well, I haven't found someone like you. John blurted out. An awkward pause followed. They stood next to each other, either lowering their eyes to the floor like schoolchildren caught kissing under the stairs, or looking directly into each other's eyes, as if playing a staring game, trying to find answers to all their questions there. And then they lowered their gaze to the floor again, but didn't part. Okay, I agree. Just don't get too close, said Betty. Noted. I'll come to you tomorrow morning, John said kissed her hand for some reason, and hastily ran off on business. Wait! Betty called out. Where are you going to come to? I didn't tell you the address. But John had already disappeared. All night, Betty caught herself thinking about what to wear. Oh, Lord! But it's a funeral, of course, all black. Everything black. And how would she look in black? She hadn't even worn black at her father's funeral. In the morning, the doorbell rang. John, thought Betty. How do you know where I live? she asked. Betty had recently moved to this communal flat. Well, I know everything about you. You're my bride. John smiled. They went into the yard, where there were several cars. So, which one is yours? Betty asked jokingly, expecting them to head to the bus stop. This one, John pointed to a brand new shiny black jeep. They walked towards it, and Betty noticed through the tinted windows that someone was sitting behind the wheel. Yeah, right, John. Some guy is sitting there, Betty said. What? Seriously? I didn't notice, John joked, but still led Betty to the car and opened the rear door. Are you crazy? John, I'm not getting into someone else's car. Betty protested in a hushed voice. Then he almost forcefully made her sit in the car and closed the door. He sat in the front seat and silently instructed the driver, who seemed like a statue, to drive to the cemetery. Betty couldn't say a word during the whole journey. She just listened to her heart pounding. John, could he have become a successful businessman so quickly after finishing school? A jeep, a driver. What does he do? Probably something illegal, Betty thought, trembling with fear. Okay, she decided. I'll stand at the cemetery next to him, and that's it. I'll go home by bus, she decided. Yeah, what's the use? Betty realized. He knows where she lives anyway. She didn't tell him the address. Darn it, I need to move to another city urgently. Yeah, what's the point? He'll find me anyway. Maybe I should go to the police. Let them, well, like in the movies, forbid him to approach me. Panic-stricken, Betty tried to figure out what to do. If only she had known that he had become such a wealthy man, she wouldn't have come close to him. Maybe. Maybe it's all a bluff. Betty suddenly thought. Maybe he rented this jeep and driver? Just like he rented me. 
Why not? She read that in Japan, there's even a business where you can rent everything. Even a bride and groom. Even children, just to fool relatives and friends. You can rent a car and even hire a driver, but not a bride. No bridal rentals here. So, he was running around looking for someone, willing to call even a janitor. Betty mused. No, what's wrong with that? Just asked for the address at work. When Betty decided to do this, she immediately calmed down. The brain is an amazing thing. It always comes to the rescue when needed. And if necessary, it will invent an explanation itself and believe in it. The most important thing is how everything carefully fell into place. There weren't many people at the cemetery, only close relatives. Betty was very nervous. She was trembling. It all calmed down when John took her hand. His big warm hand squeezed her icy fingers. The warmth gradually penetrated her hand and, warming the fingers, warmed Betty's soul. Suddenly, she remembered her childhood, school, and the kisses with John under the stairs, caught by the deputy headmistress. On graduation day, when everyone kissed whoever they wanted, and no one caught anyone. And then they walked all night. Go and kiss him on the forehead, Betty heard John's voice from somewhere, as if from a distance, like from another dimension. Who? Betty asked. Father, John replied. Why? Because you're my bride, John said. Oh, Betty approached the deceased. She leaned down, and immediately, with an almost professional gaze, noticed that there were no blue spots on the deceased, which should have been there, especially considering the painkillers they gave him in the hospice. There should have been marks from the drugs. Betty touched his forehead with her lips. So warm. This is impossible. Yes, he's breathing. He's breathing. Betty shouted. Quiet, quiet, Betty. You're overexcited. It's just your imagination. It happens. They brought him from the morgue. They did an autopsy there. He can't breathe, John whispered in her ear, trying to lead her away from the coffin. Give me a mirror, ladies. What? Nobody has a mirror. Betty insisted. Someone handed her a mirror. She brought it to John's father's nose. At first, there was nothing, but then a barely noticeable spot appeared, as if a mist from exhaled air. See? Betty cried, showing the mirror. I'm a doctor, understand. He's alive. Call an ambulance. John approached his father and forcefully tore off his clothes. There was no scar on him. No autopsy had been performed. They took the father to the hospital. They managed to revive him. Doctors said they found a rare substance in his blood, which in small doses could even be therapeutic. But if the dosage is slightly increased, it would slowly destroy a person. Taking away his life bit by bit, drop by drop, in his younger years, he would become a frail old man and die as if from cancer. In reality, he wouldn't die but would be in a coma. Such poison was used by Native Americans for the execution of particularly dangerous criminals in their tribes. Essentially, the person slowly dies, realizes he is dying. But in the end, he is buried alive and he understands everything but can do nothing. One of John's father's recent mistresses had recently traveled to South America. She brought back such a rare souvenir. The lady didn't quite understand the situation in John's family. She assumed all the wealth belonged to the father. But could a teenager amass such a fortune in seven years? She bet on the wrong horse. She should have dealt with the son, not the father. What did she hope for? Was it the truth? It's hard to understand. Perhaps she thought he would marry her on his deathbed and everything would be hers? She seemed to have watched too many movies. 
In any case, she was imprisoned, and about the father, they said they found an antidote, so he would live. He would even have grandchildren, he just wouldn't look younger anymore. Is all this true? Are you really rich? And is that car yours? Betty asked John when it was all over. And what, do you think I'm lying? John asked. No, I don't think so. It's just now, probably, you need to tell your father the truth, that you don't have a bride. You're not a liar. Betty said. Probably, I should, John hesitated strangely. Suddenly, he kissed her right on the lips, jumped into his jeep, and left without looking back. Betty worried, would he pursue her? But no, John seemed to have evaporated. He didn't call, didn't wait at the entrance, and didn't come to work. But Betty still felt uneasy. She decided it would be better to move. Anyway, there was nothing more for her in this city. Maybe in another city, she could succeed not as a janitor, but finally in medicine. Perhaps they needed paramedics somewhere. Here, a general practitioner in an emergency room. When she had already found a buyer for her room and quit her job, a messenger suddenly brought her an envelope. There was no need to pay. She took it and carefully opened it. Inside was an invitation with no sender specified. However, the invitation was for dinner tomorrow at that same floating restaurant they used to visit with her father. Enjoy your evening, said the messenger, smiled, and vanished into thin air. Why not, thought Betty. It had been so long since she went anywhere, dressed up, or had delicious food. The invitation was incognito. Well, who will be there? A maniac? Well, fine. As the joke goes, if you attack yourself, defend yourself. Besides, she was invited not to some alley, not to the woods, and not to a cave. This was a restaurant, a crowded place. If anything happened, she could shout and bite. She sat at a table and was very surprised that there were no other guests. No matter how many times they came here with her father, there was always someone in the hall. However, she wasn't alone. A small orchestra playing live music was tuning their instruments. Waiters were bustling around. In general, people were still there. Betty wondered who could have sent her the invitation. Suddenly, some unobtrusive but familiar music started playing. It seemed popular during their school years. It seemed she danced to it with John at the prom. At that very moment, he entered the hall in a snowy white suit with a huge bouquet of crimson roses. Betty forgot how to breathe. He was so handsome. Even before, when they were dating in school, John wasn't this beautiful. Or maybe he was, but she didn't notice or didn't want to notice. He approached and, kneeling down, handed her the roses. Unable to resist, Betty closed her eyes and literally immersed her face in the cool velvety petals. Oh, what a fragrance. How they smell. I wish I could fill the bathtub with these petals and immerse myself there. She felt the color flood her face. She put the bouquet aside and wanted to go out onto the deck when she suddenly saw that John was still kneeling in front of her, holding a red box with a ring. Betty, marry me. John said. Betty covered her face with her hands. How does he know everything? Does he read her thoughts? After all, this is exactly how she wanted to be proposed to. Everything exactly as she dreamed. This couldn't be a coincidence. And if about her favorite restaurant, it could somehow be known. She could have blurted it out or mentioned in childhood that she used to come here with her father. But how could one guess about the white suit? All girls dream of a prince on a white horse, and Betty dreamed of a prince in a white suit. Exactly in such a snow-white suit, she imagined her groom. I agree, said Betty, and tears streamed down her cheeks. They were tears of happiness. 
As a wedding gift, John presented her with the same apartment her father had bought for her. As it turned out, he had bought it back when Betty was selling it to get rid of debts. Do you still dream of becoming a doctor? John asked after the wedding. And if you want to continue your education, I'll pay for your residency. Or do you want me to build you an entire hospital? You know, it was not my dream. I don't think it was Dad's either. He had a heart condition, and he wanted me to become a cardiologist. He thought I could cure him. He just wanted to live. But I don't think he wanted me to be a doctor, Betty said. I think it's time for me to try to find myself and discover my own dream.